should cheer. Hello, everybody. Thanks for getting up. Well, early for a Sunday after three days of PAX, two and a half days of PAX already. Uh, appreciate you coming out to our classic RPG panel. Uh, we'll go ahead and have the panelists introduce themselves and give a little bio of uh, why they deserve to be on the panel in the first place. So we'll go ahead and start all the way down at the end. All right. I'm Adam Heine. I'm the design lead on Torment Tides of Numenera, which is a successor to Planescape Torment, which I also worked on back in the day. So... <laughs> Thanks. You're just saying that because you haven't played Tides of Numenera yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Sven Zinke. I'm the creative director at Alarian Studios. Uh, we are, uh, our last game was Divinity Original Sin, and now we're doing Divinity Original Sin 2. And that's it. Yeah. I'm Josh Sawyer, and I'm a game director at Obsidian Entertainment. I most recently worked on Pillars of Eternity and the expansion The White March, and then back in the day I worked on Icewind Dale, uh, Icewind Dale Heart of Winter, Icewind Dale 2, Neverwinter Nights, stuff like that. My name is uh, Mitch Gittleman. I'm the co-founder and studio manager of Harebrained Schemes right here in Seattle, Washington. Yeah. And uh, we make uh, the Shadowrun series. I was one of the game directors and writers. I thank you very much, sir. We have one person who liked our game, but I appreciate you very much. No, two. Thank you. Could I think three? Thank you very much, back there. An option four, give me four, for your give me love. So, um, See how he did that. Uh, I've worked on pretty much all our games except the new one that we're showing here called Necropolis, which you should check out. It's our uh, real-time combat game, uh, roguelike. And uh, before that, I've worked in the industry since I'm a wee babe, and I've done a lot of stuff, including a lot of Battletech games. Hi, I'm Annie Vandermeer Mitsoda. I've been in the game industry for about 11 years. Uh, I wor worked on Neverwinter Nights 2 and its two expansions, uh, Guild Wars 2 and Destiny, and most recently, uh, I'm, I'm a writer designer at Double Bear Productions, and I most recently worked on Dead State. Uh, my name is Jeff Callis. I'll be your moderator this morning. Uh, I've been in the video game industry 21 years. Let's see, RPG. Oh, I helped name some Pokemon in Gold and Silver. I named a bunch <laughs> of those. And uh, I worked on the Penny Arcade Rain Slick last two games, episodes three and four. So there's my RPG cred. <laughs> All right. It's a good credit. <laughs> We're going to start... Uh, with a you know easy softball question to get things rolling, what defines an RPG? <laughs> <laughs> no. More specifically, um, how do you differentiate what a classic RPG is versus it seems so many RPG elements, and we may have to define what those are as well, uh, bleeding over into a bunch of other genres. So, so who wants to tackle what they think an RPG is at its essence? I'm going to leap into that one really quickly because I was just talking about this with somebody uh, and it sprung from a frustration of um, RPGs are the most poorly defined genre in gaming. Like, they, I'm going to stand by that one till the day I die because you get a racing game, you get a shooter, you know what you're getting. But um, uh, RPGs have a million subgenres and anytime you really try to drill down on one of those subgenres, there's an exception for every single one of them. Uh, the best way I can define an RPG is just big. They're, <laughs> like, they have to be sizable in some way. You expect, um, in terms of systems, you expect a sizable amount of those. In, in, time, in terms of content, you have to have a lot of it. In terms of length, you expect a lot. Like, the expectations for those are always just big like it's a it is a poor descriptor but it's the only one that i feel like i can center in on it's just like Muh. it's large they're big even if they're not long they require complexity all right so when you say big you're 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 almost um the subheading is big slash complexity in some aspect okay has anyone else got a yeah, well for me um rpgs like what makes a real rpg i mean it's a, there's been a tendency for like, I don't know, 20, 30 years ever since RPG was a thing to say if you slap st uh, stats and experience and leveling up on it, that's an RPG. Um, but for me, it's really like, uh, it's really about the story and it's especially about the player choice um, and having that mean something. Uh, like, um, you know, you get a game like, like, like Mass Effect, which I really like, 
before I say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great game. It's beautiful, but it's kind of like watching a movie for me. You know, um, I really like the shooter parts. I love the cinematics, but when I was told this is an RPG and I played it, I was like, really? Like, I, it's sort of pretending that I have choice, you know? And um, so for me, that's a lot of it. And it, it probably comes down to the games I've worked on. That's kind of what we are focusing on, super choice. But that would, uh, that's sort of where the complexity comes from, too, that, that Annie's talking about. It's uh, to get that choice is ridiculously complex in a way people don't really realize most of the time. I'd like to add to that. Um, I'm uh, an old school paper and pencil role player. And so, uh, any of you out there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so, when I think about role playing games, I really think about role playing and bringing myself to the game. And so, as a result of that, they're often very complex and very big because unfortunately human beings have a lot of freedom and want a lot of freedom from their games, which by the way is extremely expensive. <laughs> and so, uh, as I approach role-playing games, you think, you know, a lot of people think of it as a, a character sheet and stuff like that with stats, but that character sheet for me represents uh, choices that I've made in my character and how I want to grow my character and how I want to represent myself in this particular game world. And so as uh, the designers on our team uh, approach our stories, which may not be sprawling, but they are complex, I agree. Uh, we really think about it in terms of what can the player bring to the story and what does the story present to the player. Yeah, I would like to add, for, for, for me at least, it's about uh, giving you systems with which you can create your own narrative and then obviously trying to make a world that's going to react to that. That's pretty much core about how we're approaching it. Okay. I would say that when I look at uh, choice and how important choice is, I think about the personality of the, of the character. It's about being able to decide, I want to play a character that is like this in terms of personality and make choices that align with those personality choices and then you get feedback that is actually meaningful within the context of the story. So making personality choices that don't actually have any impact to me is not enough. Like, oh, I can say a sarcastic line. Well, okay, well, where does that go? Does that add up to something in the long run? Does it make a small difference? Does it make a big difference? That goes back to some of the systemic things that you were talking about, things like tracking personality and reputation and stuff like that. Um, I think the player needs to feel validated for the type of character they want to play, both in the mechanical sense, but also in terms of the type of person they want to be. Okay, so we, everyone, you've discussed what RPG means to you, but that's not always what it means to the consumer that you are making the game for. So what have your experiences been in communicating the games that you have developed and what an RPG means to a consumer when you're selling an RPG? Stats. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, we actually had a hard time, a tricky time with that on Torment. So, um, just a little backstory. My my game career path has been really weird. Like I worked on Planescape Torment, and then I was out of the game industry in my I had an office space job basically for five years, and then um, my wife. I'm and gonna I have to in. have you come in on Sunday. What? Just gonna have to, yeah, <laughs> go ahead and ask you to. <laughs> and then, uh, like, my wife and I actually moved to Thailand like 10 years ago, and uh, so I was actually not even playing games for a few years. And then when um, when Colin called Colin McComb called me into work on Torment, I started you know playing games again for research, and uh, and uh, I was I was surprised by some of the things that I saw. Uh, I was I was playing like Neverwinter Nights 2, the main campaign. I ha I haven't played the expansion packs yet. Sorry. Um, and uh, and and Mass Effect and and looking at some other games like this and it was it was really different from what we were doing back in the Infinity Engine days. You know, it it wasn't it it wasn't as much about I'm going to be a broken record. It wasn't as much about the choice and letting the player's choices matter. The player had choices, but it felt almost arbitrary. And uh, so. I remember your original question now, I promise, <laughs> I'll get to it. <laughs> uh, so when we launched the Torment Kickstarter, there were a whole lot of assumptions that, from people who hadn't played Planescape, um, that we were creating something like Dragon Age or like Mass Effect. 
And it was actually really tricky to answer all of those. Like people would ask things like, like we, uh, we, we introduced our alignment system, which has kind of five facets to it. And they're like, oh, so does that mean you get five dialogue choices, one for each alignment system? And we're like, no, no, it's, it's more organic than that. Or we'd say, we're going to have romance in the game. And they're like, oh, does that mean you get to have sex with every single of your, one of your companions? We're like, no, it's more organic than that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we had to keep fielding these questions and, and almost educate people about, like, what Planescape Torment and that style of game was. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing, you know. So. RPGs, I think, are... This is also... Bear in mind, I'm like a grain of salt. This is from somebody who spent her whole career working on RPGs, and, and it is my favorite genre. They're, they're really hard to work on, not just because they are so complex, but it seems like... They're two completely different, I mean, main sort of ways people have come into, I would say, a more specific relationship with RPGs. And one is the, like, the big budget ones, you know, Mass Effect, Dragon Age. They have a certain set of expectations about these more cinematic experiences. And then there's the old school set, which comes from, like, Infinity Engine games and stuff that's uh, um, a lot more about free choice, you know, potentially, like, less high res, but, like, they are going to bring different expectations to the table, and it's difficult to sort of try to meet them and either try to meet them in the middle or be like, well, no, this is the kind of experience we're trying to provide. I think the, the strength of RPGs is that um, because they're so wide and kind of, let's face it, ill-defined, um, they can offer so much. So it's very hard to, to, you kind of have to pick out specific marketing ways to be like, oh, for the, the new people be like, well, you know, it's they, what do they want from the experience? They want this sort of, um, you know, sense of like direction and focus and, and power and control. And the old school set wants to know these sort of, uh, you know, systems and stats and so on and like, uh, like sometimes it just comes down to actually some of the best ways that we had to sell Dead State was uh, tacking onto touchstones. Like, did you guys like the classic XCOM? Did you like Jagged Alliance? Did you like Fallout? It has these elements, and like learning quick elevator pitches for those was really key. But like, the more you want to put in it, the harder it becomes to sort of describe it. Like, it's a fun thing to do, and it's it's a way to like, you know. I, no genre has felt closer to my heart than RPGs because there's so much shit in there that comes from uh, wanting to fill out a game, but it, they're really hard to sell and they're really hard to describe. And just trying to sum it into like bullet points, like oh yeah, bullet pointed, right. like it's kind of disheartening. But at the same way, it's like well, it's a box. <laughs> we had uh, the same problem. Uh, we, for years, we were trying to market Original Sin, trying to explain to people all the things that you could do in the game, and everybody said, so it's like Diablo. No, no, you can do this and this and that. It's like, like Diablo. And so we had, it's like, a, it's like a modern Diablo. I said, God, sorry. And, and so you would spend, and you would be, for hours, I would be showing them all the systems that you could abuse to your advantage and the combat and the cool things that you can do. And they so, and then I would see the article, it's like Diablo. I said, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and it was then surprisingly, uh, and to first pick up on what you said, Annie, uh, somebody at IGN had actually figured out the perfect pitch for us. He said it's a modern day Baldur's Gate 2, which it wasn't, but he said, okay, I'll start saying that, and that worked. <laughs> <laughs> So, because our inspiration was more Ultima 7, which was a different uh, school of thought and, uh, on RPGs. And so, but it's a uh, modern day Baldur's Gate 2, I'll live with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think it's interesting how you guys have t talked about how, in order to help communicate your game, you're having to say, well, it's a little bit like this, and this part's from here, and this part's from here. When you are going through your, your initial creation phase and trying to figure out, uh, what what type of RPG your 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 game is? Um, how are you figuring out what themes you're using? Like what settings you're using? Uh, basically, what is your inspiration? Because historically RPGs have kind of been fantasy settings, but I, I, it's been great in the last several years. We're seeing a lot of a lot more a variety of themes: uh, post-apocalyptic, zombie, steampunk. Um, how do you mix the two of trying to be unique and different, but still having enough familiarity with these things, these, these past games, uh, that you're not so far outside that consumers can't understand what you're trying to do. Um, I would say on Pillars of Eternity it was very tricky because it's such a traditional setting in so many ways. And so there were certain things, and there's, 
there's a lot of grognards who will certainly let us know if we're stepping outside of the boundaries of, you know, there are not six stats. What are you talking about? You know, like, like people get really, you know, upset about things like that. So we had to be very careful about um, how we chose to differentiate ourselves from very, very traditional settings and rule sets. Um, and it was, we actually, so we have a guy on our team, Bobby Null, who's our lead area designer, and he's probably the closest to the, our like forums, grognards, um, where he's like, he's very traditional. And so whenever we do something that where he kind of goes like, nah, I don't know, then we like, okay. Well, so what, so there are certain things like we said, okay, we, there are gonna be people, gonna be people who wanna play elves. Let's just accept that. They're gonna play, they're wood elves, the woodiest wood elves you've ever seen. <laughs> that's fine. Mountain dwarves, okay, that's fine. And then after that, we're like, do we need gnomes or orcs or halflings? Nope. And so we just decided, like, no, we won't have those. But we will have at least the very traditional elves. We also have wacky pale elves and boreal dwarves and shit like that. But um, the core stuff we wanted to leave alone. And for the same reason, we have wizards that are not exactly the same as they are in D&D, but they're fairly close to how they are in D&D. And we said, so we're going to leave certain traditional things as they are, or at least very close to as they are. Mm -hmm. And then when we add new classes like ciphers and chanters, we can do whatever we want with them. And because they're being made you know, basically from scratch, uh, and because those traditional touchstones are there, there's less resistance to them. Whereas if we just said, like, it's all, you know, we're making everything from scratch, and then people would have been, I think, reasonably upset. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a great word to use. I'm totally going to steal it. Touchstones. Like, I think every game needs to have a core touchstone. And ours was like, well, we, we saw a sort of deficit in the zombie experiences that were out there going, well, let's look at the sort of long-term, like, the Romero style, like, something that wasn't just like, bang, bang, shooty zombie, but, but actually human-focused about tension and survival and something that... that dealt with a lot more of, of the human aspect. Like, it would have been less exciting, but like we wanted to be like, conceptually speaking, could you swap out zombies in our game with another um, uh, major crisis? Like, there was a, a, like a massive hurricane, or I don't know, like, I hate to say day after tomorrow, but like sweeping climate change. Again, less exciting, but something that puts people in a, in a really difficult situation. So we had like the touchstones of like the Romero undead, and also, um, the project leads experiences uh, living through uh, Hurricane Andrew in Miami in 1988 and seeing what what that did. So like those kind of core crises and sort of leaping from that. And you did have, have to sort of like wear the robes of like, oh yeah, it's like if you're a zombie fan, it's like Romero, like that's the that's the crooked finger to bring you close. And then going, okay, now let's show you what else we have. Well, with with Shadowrun, we're kind of lucky in that. First of all, it's a game that's been around since 1989. So, thank you again, sir. And, uh, <laughs> and so we're also blending two of those sort of touchstone type things, you know, the, the cyberpunk meets uh, your D&D &D tropes in 2056, uh, where our last game took place. So you've got that, all right, I know Neuromancer, I get that kind of thing, or I understand what a street samurai is, and then of course I've got elves and dwarves and trolls. But as Anne was saying, the cool thing is when we mash this up, for some people, that mashup can be kind of like, eh, can you do that? And is that fun? And is that cool? And our response is, well, yeah, we're going to spend years doing it, so I, I really <laughs> hope so. But, and the way that we did it, I think, which I think the audience has responded well to, is it's about people in that bizarre mashup setting and turning those tropes on their sides a little bit and saying, well, this is, you know, what would a dragon be like in the 2050s? Well, he'd probably be the CEO of a major corporation. That just, <laughs> that just sort of, oh yeah, I guess it, it would. You know, or the, the, the dwarves you know, would be tinkering with rigs and stuff like that so that they can throw their brains into uh, drones that wander around and kill things for them. I love Shadowrun so much. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Which is good after years to be able to still say that. But yeah, absolutely love it. And the other thing, I just want to harken back to our last question. Uh, in terms of what people want, because mm -hmm. I think it's about this too, is I believe that everybody wants to feel as if they matter. Mm -hmm. And so in a role-playing game, this is your opportunity in this small microcosm to matter. And our jobs as designers, I think, in role-playing games is to allow you to matter, to craft a world that you want to be transported to that is interesting to inhabit, to get out of whatever it is you're doing. 
in this case it's making a game, but <laughs> still, uh, you know, to go there and feel like you're part of that world, but you're also, you have a, a chance to affect that world in some small way and, and have repercussions happen. So, touching on that a little bit then, because uh, you guys were all pretty consensus about how you want to project yourself into the game or you want your decisions, your role playing, not necessarily your, your actual personnel, but your, the role playing character that you've created to have these elements. But there are several classic RPGs that give you a fully fleshed protagonist mm -hmm. that you, um, that, that spoon feeds you a story. Would you then consider those games not to be RPGs? I have a response. I, I, I got to <laughs> jump in because there's one in my mind that you wouldn't think is an RPG, but I think it's a tremendously successful, successful one, and that's the original uh, Batman Arkham Asylum, mm. right? Okay. Which is one of the most successful role-playing games that I've personally played. It's not traditional by any sense, but I am Batman in that game, <laughs> right? I'm. Batman, motherfucker, right? And that is just that. And then I just become better Batman. So, and that game was all about me being Batman. So, if you don't think that's an RPG, that's okay. See me after class. We'll have it out. But uh, that was a really successful role-playing experience for me. Yeah, I will straight up admit, after a 20-hit combo, I just muttered, I am the bat. You gotta. <laughs> I think the way that I look at it is I would never really engage in a debate with a person about whether or not something is an RPG, but that's not the sort of game that I would make. Yeah. Mm. Fair. Yeah. That's fair. But yeah, I, th I think they could totally be RPGs. I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of Banner Saga, it, which is it gives you the characters that you, you are, and you know, it gives you the class, it gives you the starting stats, and tells you you're the leader of this, this group of refugees. Um, but then within that, it's what you choose to do. And I think for, uh, for me, what makes it an RPG is that the game changes based on my choices and my character's role and uh, even emotions sometimes change based on my choices. And that, that to me is what makes it an RPG. I'm okay if someone gives me a stock character. What makes it an RPG is what can I do with it then. Okay. So shifting... This microphone sucks. Shifting gears a little bit, you guys, um, we, we were talking about the theme of complexity, defining uh, RPG, whether it's a, a particular system or the game itself. But that doesn't always lead itself to reasonable budgeting yeah. and creating a role-playing game. So the expectations... I think from consumers uh, of what an RPG is in, in terms of, of depth and complexity. Um, add, add complexity to the development schedule. So I, I'm just curious, how do you guys manage your, your, your development, your resources, uh, what to focus on, and uh, how to pay for it all? <laughs> this is going to sound really cynical, and I, <laughs> I've become a cynical person, but there is a point where you sort of have to make peace with the fact that you are not going to get every feature that fans want, especially, uh, like, I love the diehards. They, they are responsible for me being up here. They're responsible for my game being made. Um, like, there's a, there's a hope in everybody's heart that the next game that you play is the sequel to everything that you've ever loved. <laughs> and it will have every system and new ones that you love, and like, we all want it to be the best cake we've ever eaten. Like, we all want this. Um, but budget-wise, like, there's some things that are not possible. And like, my, my eventual dream is to hope that the, the, there seems to be a gap between our knowledge of how games get made and the, the general knowledge. And it's not like I can be like, well, you guys should learn more, because that's a dick thing to say. But um, <laughs> we can't get every system in just because some actually do take longer and we can make a design. Like, I can go up and tell you why we didn't have, um, you know, cover in Dead State from dusk till dawn. I could give you every reason on it. But if you feel like you really wanted that, I'm still not going to convince you. Like, you have to sort of... I think just double down your sort of sense of things as a, as a developer on what you feel is critical. Um, and you have to be like ruthless at every stage of development and just triage and, and draw a big circle around the things that you are like, this is the game. Mm. 
thus far and no farther. <laughs> like, if these cannot be made, we don't have a game. Like, these other things may come and go, but this is the heart. Interesting. Yeah. Has yeah. anybody actually been on time with a game here at this table? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Fall at New Vegas was on time. Okay. Yeah, Shadowrun Hong, Shadow <laughs> Hong Kong was on time. All right. Well. Uh, that's how I got gray, though. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I've never Before this, it. I was actually 20. All uh, right. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my, my hair went white on one game. Yeah. On, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So literally, I remember that Actually, I, I blame white on Microsoft. <laughs> Anybody here? No? So, but I think what Annie, what Annie says is, 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 is the core of it. And you have your core system. Once that's starting to run and you start playing that, then you probably have it. And then you have to finish up on it. Uh, but then you start playtesting and people start breaking everything because we're giving them all these systems. And that's where all your time gets lost because then you want to cater to that and you have two options. Either you expand on your systems if you, you made mistakes in them or either you're going to start cutting them and then uh, you don't want to cut. So that's how time extension happens. And then obviously it depends on how much budget you have and how, how well you can convince your CEO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, so there's a running joke at the in exile offices. So I, I, I fly out about twice a year to in exile and there's a running joke that every single trip I make, something of mine gets cut. And uh, it's it, it's getting kind of disgusting, but <laughs> um, but the reason that we do that is uh, because well, there's two reasons. One is we've got this vision for the game that we set out, and um, there are just certain things that we're just not doing. I mean, it's not and it's not just my stuff that gets cut. Other people's stuff gets cut too. But <laughs> there's there's stuff that we're just not doing. Um, like uh, Risa, a couple kick Kickstarter updates ago, we I talked about our character generation in Torment, and a number of comments were were like, "Well, wait, you don't get to like customize your your face and your hair and your your character avatar." And we're just like, "Well, no, because we're choosing the things that we want to do that this game is, and we're going to do those really well." And that's I mean that, that's kind of the second thing. Like we we're choosing first is choosing things we want to do. Second, we do it really well. Like if if we cannot do it well, we're just gonna cut it. And if it makes a smaller game but a better game, that is our goal. And that's kind of how we've had to deal with that. And we're still kind of pushing the clock here. So <laughs> that's how big these things are. When, um, I would say that when I I've mostly been a system designer for most of my career. And whenever I look at implementing systems, I always put in, uh, or I, and I, call, I ask people on the team to put in A and B priority for everything. Mm -hmm. Some other people like A, B, and C priority, I refer to C as cut. So <laughs> if, if it's really not important enough to be B priority, then it shouldn't even be on the list is the way I look at it. Um, but our assumption is that a is critical, like whatever system, whatever system or feature exists that is listed as A priority has to be done. It's a core part, a critical part of the game. B is something that we feel will make it better. And as time goes on, we find that the priority on those things shift and you might get some of the Bs, some of the Bs you're never ever gonna get to. And like you said, there are certain things that you find where it's like, well, this system doesn't even work at all. So even if it has the A priority in, we don't want it to be as it is. So we just try to factor in um, like we know we're not going to get to do absolutely everything and when we look at things and have to prioritize them that forces us to take a serious look at what's really really vital to making the game succeed. Mm, they fall yeah. prey to Mr. Snippy. <laughs> yes. One Mr. thing that, that changed of course that we didn't have before is things like early access. So once you go in there you have a lot of people that are playing it and they're, they're putting in funding which allows you to fix certain things or to add certain things that suddenly turn out to be in big demand. Obviously that will add to the delay that's going to happen with your game. But sometimes in our case it was definitely worth it. So you, you guys talked about the scale and the amount of work and, and everything and so I think, well first of all anyone who gets into games they have a passion for it. But what is it about the RPG genre that inspired you or uh, that you most are passionate and identify with that means that those are the games that you guys want to make? I'm getting a little psychologically here. Uh, for me personally, it's about giving the player an experience and having the player emotionally uh, connected to the game such that 10 years after playing, they still have that emotional connection. And when you're at PAX or when you're at Gen Con, they come up to you and say, that was a, that was a big moment for me. When this thing happened, I, I cared. Mm -hmm. and that, that's it for me personally. And you find that RPGs are the most effective way to get those 
emotional responses? Yeah, for me, yeah, personally, although there are a couple of people, I still can't beat this level in Mech Commander 2. <laughs> <laughs> and I blame you for that. Like, it's that a actually, different that, emotional that, response. Blame, blame <laughs> is a scary one. Yeah, well, I, I have a very personal connection with some people. <laughs> I'm cuckoo for world building. Like, I, yeah, some people might be like, well, you know, Dead State was set in the real world. But, like, the concept of, of world building is not even just, oh, I invented something from whole cloth. But it is is taking a structure and, uh, and building it out. Seeing, you know, creating a character and then just sort of, like, ideally in a writing space, once you make a character, you just sort of, now this sounds completely crazy, but... I'm in the game industry, so make assumptions about my sanity already. Um, you just sort of let them go and have them talk at you and see see where they go within a shape sort of space. Like, um, and now this is going. To, I'm going to switch from crazy to morbid. Uh, one of the the things about building levels in in Dead State was there weren't that many people to talk to, so basically the levels themselves had to tell stories. So basically when I would put a level together, I'd be like, okay, here's here's you know this apartment complex and everything is pretty and everything is nice. And here's how everything fell apart. Like tip this over, blood splat here. Like I want somebody to run into it and be like, oh my God, this is, and like walk through how things went down. Like that's a morbid world building, but like I have to admit, I love that. Like how do I pull a story out of this? How do I, how do I impact you without using any words? Um, and like, one of my favorite characters that I got to, to touch on actually was um, during my tenure of uh, at Guild Wars 2. Um, they let us on the personal story. They let us work on um, the mentor characters, and my favorite character is Tybalt Leftpaw. And I got to work on it with a very talented designer. And there was one point she and I looked at each other and were like, "We're gonna make some people cry." <laughs> like the point of these characters is to make players cry because we cried first. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and it all touches back to getting that emotional response yeah, from, yeah. from a player. Stories and hitting you right in the feels. Yeah, I, I would say that it comes down to. Um, Letting players feel like they have a lot of freedom with what they do, um, and they're not really bounded by a lot of stuff. Obviously, there are always boundaries to games, but um, for example, on Fallout New Vegas, which is less classic than, than a lot of the games we've been talking about, but one of the principles that I took from the original Fallout was ability to kill everybody. Um, we, so I said, I told the designers, I said, you must assume that you, you basically have one conversation. Like a character, if you open a door, that character could be there and say, hello, and then after that conversation ends, you must assume that the player immediately murders them. <laughs> and, and the designer said, well, well, you know, like, well, why? And I said, because they might hate that character's guts and just want to murder them. Like, I don't, they don't need a reason. They just might just like that character. And so you, Never must, ask why. you must design the quest as though that character immediately dies due to involuntary flamethrower death. Um, <laughs> And Wait, can you explain voluntary flamethrower? In involuntary, <laughs> yes. Well, the idea that I said is, imagine that the player just has a flamethrower that constantly shoots out in front of them. So they didn't mean to, they just accidentally murdered that person. Um, and so it did make it more difficult for the designers, but uh, they found ways to allow you to complete all the quests. And even Yes Man, who is kind of the fall through if you're killing everyone in the game, you can still kill Yes Man. It's just another Securitron takes his personality and rolls up to you later. And he actually apologizes for making you so mad that you had to kill him. Um, <laughs> But it's about. But the thing is, it's it's not about saying, well, we assume that the player is going to want to murder everyone. It's letting the player know that at any point in time, if they say, I don't like that guy, they can just blow him away, and it's not going to actually break the game. Mm -hmm. So that feeling, which I get from tabletop, which is allowing a player not ar arbitrarily saying as a GM, no, you can't kill this guy, but playing it out within the rule system and then modifying the story as the GM trying to capture that feeling within a, a computer game, I think, is what really appeals to me. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that, for me, is exactly why I, I like making RPGs, too. It's from the, the tabletop experience. Like, my favorite gaming experiences have been tabletop RPGs, you know? TMNT, D&D, Numenera more recently. And um, it's that collaborative storytelling where anything can happen. And it's, it's hilarious, or it's scary, or it's, it's unexpected. And I don't know that CRPGs can ever totally replace that, but I love trying. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Uh, basically, what you just said, I repeat that every week. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever somebody comes up with something where you can't kill one of the actors in the quest, they have to redo it. We call it N plus one design. There's always that one fallback uh, solution. Like typically, that would be a letter. In Original Sin 2, there's a ghost which is going to pop up, so we can go to the yep. ghost. Uh, <laughs> but then we added that you can eat the ghost, and so you have to go to the underworld. <laughs> <laughs> but you can always go back and get the information that you need. So, and uh, it's that freedom also giving people. And then nowadays that we have Twitch or YouTube. I, I really love watching people play and goof around. I mean, the things that you see when you give them these kind of systemics, which come from tabletop RPGs or pen and paper RPGs, is just beautiful to see. And it okay. gives you a lot of enjoyment. Awesome. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and open it up to audience questions. We've got two floor mics here in the aisle. And as people are getting ready, I just want everyone to give us your favorite role-playing game of all time. All time? All time. Am I allowed to say Planescape Torment? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> if I'm not allowed to play plane, say Planescape Torment, all time. I, okay, I, I'm gonna say Banner Saga. I am in love with it. Right. Wow. Sorry, okay. <laughs> it's not super classic, but I'm in love with it. Okay. For me, it's gonna be uh, Ultima Seven. Um, I would imagine Serpent Isle. Right. For me, it's actually between three that I kind of rolled hit between uh, Darklands, which nobody knows about. Um, I do. You're streaming yes. it. <laughs> Thank you. I am streaming it. Yeah. Um, Pool of Radiance, the original gold box game, yeah. and Fallout One. I had the Beholder. Oh, yeah, old school. Oh, God. Gold box. Mine was split between I the Beholder 2 and Fallout. Like, mm. oh, man. <laughs> All right, Bat and Kaidos, which no one's ever heard of. All right, we'll start over on this side. Um, first, I'd like to say, hi, guys. Thank you for having this panel, um, and thank you for having a woman on the panel. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> it's her panel. It's her panel. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> She's in it's charge of the panel. living in it. This is like the A team of RPG developers. Right? I was like, guys, let's do a panel. So I'm actually a chairman of a LARP that's uh, nationwide, and right now we're going through some tough times because we're doing a complete rules overhaul. Um, our rules are 20 years old and have been patched because of the fact that we had a game that you know we thought was going to stay small and then exploded countrywide. Um, so my question for you is. Um, essentially, how do I think about core mechanics and trying to keep things balanced when we had all of this cutoff, um, and what the best practices are to do that? Oh man, why are so hard? Core mechanics for LARPs, huh? I, so race and class, essentially, and making oh, yeah, sure the yeah. classes are balanced. Oh no, I, I used to LARP my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> that's no about it. Is that wrong? I have never <laughs> thought that deep. <laughs> uh, it is a disturbing image. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I think it's really hard, especially when you have such a legacy built up. Um, people can be really resistant to changes in status quo when it comes yeah, to rule Yeah, and that's sets. really the hardest thing we're having right now. Um, I think I don't know. From my perspective, usually I try to th I try to think about things from the perspective of all players involved, which is extremely difficult. Mm. But especially um, in LARP. Especially in LARP, but um, but it, sort of talking through it with people, I guess. From my perspective, when I, whenever I talk about rules things, it's not about me or my opinion or the other person's opinion. It's about what is going to produce something that is, is, is going to produce good gameplay for everyone. And sometimes that means that some things might get nerfed or they're changed or some other classes might get elevated in a way that people are not initially comfortable with. Um, but usually I just try to talk through the thought process with people. Uh, you are never, ever going to make everyone happy. Oh, absolutely. And um, I, I do think that for me, the on, on Pillars of Eternity, because it's such a traditional game, if there's something essential about a class that feels very, very core and key, if that can stay without sort of ruining balance elsewhere, leave it alone. Um, like, we kept wizards with grimoires because that feels like a, a very D&D type thing. We don't do it the exact same way that D&D does it, but having wizards have grimoires felt important. It felt important that they were different from clerics and druids. So I guess that's kind of the way I look at it is, is you know, like paladins should probably have lay on hands and they should probably have something where they smack someone with holy flames or some shit. So, you know, like once, once you sort of establish like these are very important to making the class feel the way that it should feel, how it works mechanically maybe can be modified and people will be more receptive to it. That's my experience personally. Okay. Yeah. Good answer. That's crazy. Thank you very much. I Thank appreciate you guys it. so very much. Thank you. All right. By the way, I will also say somewhere in here maybe is Shane DeFriest who was involved in the Mind's Eye Theater reboot, so if you can find him, uh, annoy him. There you go. Oh, Mind's Eye. All right. That's old school. On my left here. Hello. Um, so this is kind of a simple one, but I was curious what tropes you guys really want to see eliminated from RPGs. Of all oh, sorts. that's a good question. What, what tropes, tropes would you ban from the RPG genre? Oh, I, I, 
There are lots of tropes that I that I, I I prefer to take a trope and like mess with it. Like I like to to lay it out on a table and dissect it and find out the why of it. Um, although that said, um, if I could stop waking up in a jail. <laughs> man or at least be like let me choose why i was there like oh i was wrong playing clears you're like oh my god you partied so hard last night like give me give me a, a chance to build a reason why i was there but otherwise if i could stop waking up in a jail or like who am i and how did i get here <laughs> like i know why those work I know, I know why they're functional, but like, could we right. move mm. on from them? That would be yeah. cool. Anyone else? I would say collect more than a few things. Like, never go and collect two things or three things, and like, <laughs> definitely not of the same type. Yeah. Um, that I, 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 it drives me completely bananas when I see that. Yeah, I would really like to never kill a rat or a bat <laughs> or a snake or a spider yeah. ever again. That would be great. I'd rather not break a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what if that barrel killed your father? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just plug in for less chips and bikini armor. Mm. I don't think I have any. I don't think I have any like super. I just basically want to see fewer instances of the tropes. So for me, it's especially working on something that is very very traditional. It's less about making sure that no one trope appears. I'm more saying like just don't overdo it. Don't like keep repeating the same things over and over again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, over here. Yeah, I just wanted to ask now, for me as an older RPG enthusiast, Kickstarter presented a really nice opportunity to start seeing some of those older genres come back. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I invest is because many of you uh, have a pedigree of quality. I just don't go in for game concept more so. I know these guys make good games. I'll take a chance on them. And I've seen games get washed out with community feedback. Like, they want to make people happy. But really, I'd be a little more happy if some of them said, you know, screw off, we're making the game we want, and that's what you invested in. <laughs> where do you guys draw the line ah, good where community feedback comes in and your vision stays and you don't compromise? Mm -hmm. And also, Planescape Torment's my favorite game of all time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. How do you hold off the screaming masses? <laughs> I, I would like to answer that one since we're currently running a Kickstarter campaign, yeah. which is just... I backed uh, it. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so uh, we learned a lot from the previous one because in the previous one we were doing what we were seeing everywhere without really thinking and we say we're going to have like uh, elementals which are going to be named after Kickstarter backers and we're going to have all this user generated content in there. Turned out to be a horrible idea. Uh, and uh, so what we're doing now is we're really uh, only putting in things that we really think would add to the game and we're refusing because there's a lot of demand for it but we're refusing to add anything else and just telling people look these are things that make a lot of sense in there and if we're going to add anything else there, we're actually going to start breaking the game. And that is not our, not our ambition, and definitely not in, in this particular instance. And so it's a, it was a lesson that we had to learn because we thought that all that community feedback uh, was going to be a good thing. Sometimes it's not. So we're limiting it now to letting them vote for skill tiers, which we all want to have in the game. So we want to, every single one that is there, we will say they're all good ones. So they can all make it to the game. Uh, we have our personal preferences, of course. Uh, but uh, so that by limiting it and then saying, uh, okay, guys, uh, this is it and nothing else. And then if they mm -hmm. back, great. So I, I think it's interesting. He's managing the community much like an RPG system <laughs> where he's giving you the illusion of choice <laughs> to make you feel like you're contributing to the game. Uh, uh, we're about to start our fourth Kickstarter. And uh, I feel like I personally, and I know our studio has learned a lot about how to run a Kickstarter and how to communicate with our audience. And you know, when our very first Kickstarter was for a game called Shadowrun Returns, and it was the first, it was, I'm sorry, it was the, one, of the, one of the first, uh, right behind Wasteland 2, uh, that broke a million dollars. And uh, it was a real learning experience because we tried to say yes mm -hmm. to as many things as possible, which was, uh, stupid. <laughs> and having run that Kickstarter, I tried to get less stupid as time went on. Uh, one of the designers uh, of those games who's sitting in the front row may disagree with the getting uh, less stupid as time goes on, but we'll see. So we, you know, we pride ourselves in listening to the audience. Uh, we've done only one. Um, what do you call those things again? Where you vote? <laughs> one poll, you know, one poll, and that's it, and learn my lesson from that one and never again. And so what we try and do is encourage the audience to talk amongst themselves 
and say that we're listening to that, but we don't engage with them in debate or in conversation. Instead, we just note that, yeah, we are listening, and occasionally we regurgitate some things that we're, we're hearing, but that's about it. And I think the relationship that we've cultivated with our audience, which I'm pretty proud of, is that, you know, I'm layering this word on, you know, it's like, oh, it's our garage band, you know, and they're gonna make, you know, good stuff, and we're just gonna uh, support them as best we can and give them suggestions, and they'll either take it or not, but we've learned that we can trust their judgment, okay. uh, especially for being able to do the things they say they're gonna do and deliver it at a reasonably good quality level and reasonably on time, too. Thank you very much, that's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, in a game like Arkham Asylum, when you, before you even start the game, you already know who you're gonna play. Uh, you're playing a man named Bruce Wayne. He's practically a friend. When you make choices, you can tell immediately whether it's against character or with, or you know, within character. But in a game like Dead State or New Vegas, you start off and you have no idea who you are. What What are some of the best ways to uh, introduce opportunities in the game for you to make choices that uh, that feed into who your character is, mm -hmm. and then reinforce those choices later on in the game. So yeah, how you, how are you introducing this character to the players that are, are reinforcing uh, all of these the, the choices and, and informing who they are, but allowing the the player to also develop their own identity with them. I think a lot of the best ways as a writer and designer you can help somebody create characters. Like, it is a process that happens. It happens organically, and it happens through a lot of small things. Like, there's a massive variance in how, you know, people will approach their sort of entry into the game. I'm the person that spends, like, 45 minutes creating my character, and like, well, I want the eyes to look this way and whatnot. Like, if you give me an option, I'm going to mess with that slider. But I know at the same time, there's plenty of people who are just like, yeah, whatever, I want to get into the game. Um, and, and like, my new goal in my career is, like, the, the, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever crowds, they still play RPGs. Like, I refer to them as the press A crowd. Like, their level of engagement, it's really hard to, to get at them. And they, they understand when stuff is coming at them directly, they just deflect it. Like, the way to sort of um, provide engagement in my mind, and I keep studying trying to be better at this, is these is to make something sticky. To make something, like... <laughs> Not a not a big choice, but a subtle choice. Like when you uh, wake up in the in the basement of the school in, in Dead State at the very beginning, um, uh, you were in a plane crash, and you're given an opportunity to say if there was anybody with you. Like, uh, where's my boyfriend? Where's my family? Where's you know my my husband or wife? Or or even be like, I don't remember anything. And like those little moments are brought back into the game. Like if you give a player a chance to make a small choice. Like, you have to be able to bring that small choice back because it's become a part of the world. Like, it doesn't have to be a, like, shoot this guy or don't shoot this guy. Like, people can can see big decisions coming often from a mile away. And to the point where a lot of those decisions are not about you at all. They're about the plot. And, and building a character that informs those decisions is a lot smaller of a process in my mind. It's a lot more minute. So, because the decisions that you make every day as a, as a person builds you, not like, you know, like massive crap. We don't run into massive crap. Like, that forms us, but that's very wearying, and it can seem very fake, I think, sometimes when a game throws those at you, especially if they throw a lot at you to just define you in wide strokes. What makes you stay, in my mind, uh, are the little things, which don't sound impressive or easy to build, but... It, it's something okay. I will be consistently working on until the day I die, I think. Anyone else? I would say that um, it's, it's both uh, about giving immediate feedback and being consistent about it, and then giving more long-term feedback. Uh, and another part of establishing character, as much as uh, I know some people hate this, is uh, in giving players tools that feel like they are playing a part. So, for example, in Fallout New Vegas, we kind of realized very quickly that people would want to be like, they want to be a post-apocalyptic cowboy. And you can wear cowboy hats, and you can get, you know, revolvers, and you can get lever-action guns. And you can use those, and it's very specific and intentional that you can use those through the end of the game. So when someone sees that, they start to take on the attitude like, yeah, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be this guy. Um, in Pillars of Eternity, 
uh, we give the character things like stilettos and pikes and things like that. Um, I know one guy who uh, I'm friends with on Facebook who plays a lot of Eternity and he wants to play it as a tercio like pike and shot guy. And that's his, that's, and, and we get, you can put a little Morian helm on, you can put it on a breastplate with the things. And so he, he feels like that character and presumably he role plays like that character. Um, but as far as like the, both the systemic, uh, the immediate and the long term, uh, sometimes the gameplay systems like reputation tracking and things like that, where the player sees, oh wow, I made a choice, something changed my re reputation, and then someone responded to my reputation, that lets them know very early, hey, when you make choices like this, it actually means something in the context of the world. And then there's also the specific reactivity to individual stories, and in my experience, what I've found uh, is that when you have something that is especially long-term, but even if it's very small, players flip the fuck out. So. So for example, we had a quest in Fallout New Vegas called uh, The Whitewash, and it's where you solve this sort of water mystery, like where's the water going? It's very Chinatown. Um, and you finish it, and one of the ways you can finish it is that you don't really solve it for the NCR. You basically let people keep siphoning water off. And then, hours later, there's a random encounter you can get with this farmer, a sharecropper, and he's like, hey, asshole, thanks a lot. I can't make my quota. Now I have to head back to California. Thanks for nothing. And a lot of players found they're like, I can't believe this happened, but it's really like a very minor thing. The thing is, in New Vegas, we, inter we interleaved a lot of those, and so it felt like there was a huge amount of reactivity when really it was just a long-term thing. So I think intermixing the short-term, long-term, and the systemic things makes the player feel like there really is a, a big reactive world for them to experiment with. Okay, thank you very much. Good question. Mm -hmm. All right. So first of all, let me say I don't like touching the sliders because I realize the second I start, I never stop playing with them. <laughs> it just is a process. Yeah, exactly. The game becomes making the character. <laughs> so I'm a, an old school tabletop gamer. I've played for a long time, so I understand the concept of playing your character uh, and freedom of choice and stuff. But I just was wondering, how would you guys define a lot of JRPGs where your main character literally has no personality, like Earthbound, right? <laughs> would you consider those an RPG? You, so do you consider games that have a blank slate protagonist, are those RPGs or are they RPGs because you're able to project so much onto them that just isn't in context to the game? I'm very glad you asked that question because I was like, it came to mind earlier and it came, and it's like, that's the big thing between like trying to define an RPG and being like, well, it has this like protagonist you can shape. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, yeah, exception to every rule. <laughs> Um, and I mean, if you wanted to, and I'm going to throw out an exception to that as the Persona series where you can define a character, but I get where you're going from, so I'm not series. going, yeah. yeah, I know, it's fucking awesome, uh, I can't wait for five, but, um, but it's a situation, I think, I think in, in many ways it, it's, if we, if we drill down to size, it fits this, you know, the big category, um, if we go into, you know, the sense of emotional engagement, that's, sort of the role that they're that it seems like they're trying to play is trying to bring you into a sense of um, even just telling a meta story like with with what you equip characters with and the role that you want them to play um, you know I'm, these are these are sort of mini criteria but the problem it, it just brings it back to the problem of trying to define uh, an RPG and all the different subgenres of it uh, like, I think you could write papers and papers and papers about it, trying to, to draw a circle around it, and which is why a lot of the easiest ways to market an RPG is just through that touchstone method. Um, mm. But yeah, I I don't like picking nits about what is or isn't a thing, because I always go like, well, is this, because the, the, the question, are games art, I find a very like tiresome one, but I'd just be like, yeah, they are, they're totally RPGs, because there's a level of engagement by different criteria, like, yeah, they totally are. Has anyone um, else got? About this particular subject. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, JRPGs they come they come from a different place, you know. It's, I mean, Japan. like we're talking about classic <laughs> Japan. RPGs. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah. Hey, <laughs> like classic RPGs, we really should probably be saying classic Western RPGs because yeah. it's like the we're we're talking about the tabletop RPGs becoming CRPGs and and uh, in in our culture. Um, so I, I think they are RPGs, but I think it's kind of a different discussion, you know, yeah. and, and one I'd love to have because I love JRPGs, but it's a, they're very different things. We'll have Annie submit a panel for next year. <laughs> <laughs> classic Western versus Cheers. Classic J. Oh, boy. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I think I have a couple quick questions that uh, should be quite easy to answer. Um, uh -huh. 
the first one, uh, suspension of disbelief is a, a really a big deal with any sort of storytelling, movies or whatever for me. Um, and I kind of find that when there is voice actors um, used in like the first sentence of an interaction and then the voice acting cuts out and you've got to switch your brain over to reading that it can knock me out of the suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. Doing a full run of uh, voice actors through a whole thing is basically impossible because of the money or the size <laughs> of the download or, or they what? Are so it's expensive. a lot of things. And time. It's money and time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so I worked on, I think I can safely say I've worked on the game with the most voice acting of people at the table, which is Fallout New Vegas, because it had the record at the time, which was 65,000 lines of voice dialogue. Oh, I beat it. 65,000 lines of voice dialogue you need? Enhanced Edition has 88,000. Oh, nice. Oh. <laughs> but it was, um, but it required, it required four studios, yeah. four voice studios working concurrently for months to get it done, which yeah. meant that like our whole design team was practically taken up constantly making edits and revisions and things like that. So mm -hmm. the expense of actually voicing something like that is really, really crazy. Um, and and uh, so you know it's it's very difficult to coordinate that stuff, and we have to make a lot of difficult choices about do we want to voice do we want to voice more characters? Do we want to voice fewer characters, but entirely? But then there are also problems in a game like Eternity where you have characters that interject. So if you voice a character entirely and other characters are interjecting, then that character has to be voiced. But is that whole character voiced or just for this conversation? And it, it yeah. becomes logistically kind of complicated, and right. it's a difficult situation oh, to solve. The other problem yeah. that you have with that is that it comes at the end of your development. So yes, right. you typically, if you have to do voice everything, you have to add it on top of it. You'll be massively late if something changes. Like mm -hmm. we've been things don't change though. That's yeah. the good news. <laughs> <laughs> I want to work on your game. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of our designers says what, the the best news is that we just do it right the first time, and yeah, then, then you don't have it's much less expensive that way. Too. I would love. To. It's and a good in the Shadowrun practice. series, also the problem that we uh, fight is because we parse a lot of the conversations too. So we take on your race, your gender, you know, your character archetype, et cetera, or things that you've told us and we repeat them back to you. And so in voice, that would be yeah. uh, rather challenging. That would be crazy. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Especially if you get a mixed or a variable gender protagonist. Absolutely. And then, yep. and then in Slavic languages with characters talking to that character. And if you wanted to localize and translate it. Yeah. yeah. So that's 65,000 times, times a lot. All right. A lot. Over on my right here. So, um, Thank you all for making the games you do. Uh, I absolutely love Divinity Original Sin. Part of that was because I got to play through the whole thing with someone right next to me. So couch co-op for RPGs is not something we see a lot of. And I mm. wanted to ask, why do you think that was? Um, is there something about the genre that makes it difficult to make an experience that has multiple protagonists? And um, I think Divinity, Divinity did that amazingly can that scale to an MMO setting Ooh. where you actually feel like you matter? Interesting. You got it's lots of lots of. You we only have like four minutes left in this panel, sir. Well, I would say. So imagine saying in an RPG, you can do anything. Both of you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a big part of the complication. It's 160,000 lines of dialogue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work, of course. I mean, and uh, the the new one, Original Sin 2, you can play with up to four players, and we have this thing, competitive questing, so you can play against each other also. So that's new. Um, so it's very complicated, and it takes a lot of work, and the only reason that we can do it now is because we already built up Original Sin, so we can continue working that framework, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise it would be impossible. When that game will be finished, it will be five or six years of development, essentially, just making that possible. But you really have to do it from the get-go. Yes. Yeah. And it's, I, this will take much longer than like a, one phrase. So uh, it's just very, very, very hard. <laughs> and you really have to embed it in everything. But what helps is what you were talking about, systemic design, where you say you can kill everybody. Because <laughs> uh, that, that, that's like, it's, you have to have things like that present in there just to be able to make that co-op RPG. Because you never know what the other guy is going to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to adapt your quest in all kinds of ways because you could be doing something while I'm doing something else at the same time. And then it just becomes mind-boggling if you don't have your systems down really well from the very beginning. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So one of the things about classic RPGs that I really do like is that in combat you have either a turn-based system or a pause button <laughs> where you can send your people around and do things where in more modern RPGs, they're all action RPGs. Final Fantasy XV has you running around and bashing things. Dragon Age Inquisition was the same. Why? 
Why can't I have my pause button? <laughs> you want to go back to, to, to flat out turn based? Yes. I'm like, mine was I have no problem with that. I did that. Turn based. Um, yes, that's why I love I'm the only real time with pause buttons. So. And you got, a, you got a pause button, so you're good. You're being yeah. singled out. Um, I, I think I think it was it was done um, largely. I'm speculating. Um, I think it was done largely because uh, RPGs were trying to appear on consoles and they're making more of a presence on consoles. And the style of RTS-like or tactical type combat was not something that was, outside of things like um, Final Fantasy Tactics or um, Front Mission or things like that, was not super, pre yeah, boy. Um, <laughs> but uh, wasn't super common. And so I think they were trying to say, like, no, RPGs, like, they're like other shooters. Um, but you do see attempts mm -hmm. to hybridize that somewhat. Uh, for example, that's why I would, I would guess uh, Fallout 3 had bats. So it's kind of like, oh, okay, you can sort of, like, things are getting hectic, stop, make a target to stop on your own time, and then shoot and things like that. But I, feel, I, I think it was largely because an attempt to appeal to a wider audience across not just PC, but also console platforms, mm -hmm. where that control yeah. scheme right. just made more sense. I think sense at a basic them. level, real, pure real-time, no pause, is just more accessible to more people. And so I think the games, the, the companies that are making those RPGs, that's just, that's, that's where they're targeting. And I think we're not, yeah? Oh. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them also needed multiplayer in there. They want to have a multiplayer mm -hmm. mode uh, mm -hmm. just to be able to play co-op or online on consoles, so that makes a big difference also there. Uh, a lot of people ask us if Pillars of Eternity will ever come to console, and it's probably not because uh, the control scheme is so alien. It's really mm -hmm. most, it's best for mouse and keyboard, although Steam controller is kind of nice. Yeah. So. I would say in addition to mass market hybridization, it, there's, a, there's a fundamental different way, I think, on... Uh, classic RPGs and more genre RPGs versus um, action stuff is it's um, it scales differently. Like it has dependencies in combat that are like like a turn-based combat. There's no twitch there. There's no player agility element. It's all about uh, very very focused planning um, versus uh, you know if you went with like a core action game, it is it is on you as a player to get better at these things. Um, uh, hybridization of it, I actually think is I. Th Conceptually, I think is very fascinating because you have to account for both of those things, um, but it does put you in the sort of awkward middle ground uh, where where you do have to balance those and you do have a sort of split experience. Okay. We got, we're almost done. So our last question of the panel. Okay, so the uh, Ultima Six became Sp Spider Web Games. Ultima Seven became Divinity <coughs> Original Sin and many other games. Uh, Gold Box eventually sort of became Pillars of Eternity. What happened to, like, wizardry? It's um, gone. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, Bard's Tale 4 is trying to pick up a little bit of that. I don't know how close they're getting to wizardry. I'm not on that team. But when, the, when we were first talking about it, they were Brian Fargo was specifically talking about wizardry. So maybe you'll get it. I don't know. <laughs> There's hope in There's the hope. future. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out to the panel. Have a great rest of the packs. Big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. I just want to point out that